This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome everyone to this panel on veterans in American society. It follows up uh, on the uh, wonderful Jefferson Memorial Lecture for 2010 that was given yesterday by President James Wright, President Emeritus of Dartmouth, and a, a, a distinguished historian who spoke on veterans in the history of American democratic society and raised many important questions uh, about uh, the role of veterans in society, the ways in which veterans have been treated uh, after the wars historically uh, in America, and in particular gave attention near the end to the differences that are so obvious and so important, but which have not really been explored in depth uh, by, as between the reception of veterans after the Vietnam War and combat veterans of the present uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so these and other issues will be addressed today. Our format will be the presentation of lead comments and reflections uh, by four speakers, and then the panelists will, uh, uh, co will contribute on an ad hoc basis uh, for the remainder of our time. Let me start by, I'm Harry Scheiber, uh, professor of law and history in uh, the law school here at UC Berkeley. I'm also a member of the history department. and. Uh, so welcome all of you. I want to start the program and uh, I'll call upon the uh, speakers uh, in uh, the order that I suggested. Um, we're starting with Jan, starting with Jan Scruggs, who will be the first of our lead commentators. I'm Jan Scruggs and I'm very, uh, very pleased to be here, humbled to be here actually at uh, Berkeley. What I've been given is 10 minutes to uh, tell my story, and uh, I shall begin right now. Uh, 1968 was a year that I graduated from high school, and for me, a pretty reasonable decision seemed to be to volunteer for the draft, which required uh, two years of uh, active duty uh, service. But when you did that, the Army would select wh which uh, military specialty you went into, so they put me uh, in the infantry. And I had a sort of a bad time over there. I was wounded, I was uh, decorated. But uh, we, we took some significant casualties. And uh, coming back from Vietnam was uh, a difficult experience for many of us uh, because many of us did have some sort of post-traumatic uh, experiences, psychological difficulties coming back as well our peer group our, in our demographic was uh, very much involved in protesting the war, and many people really made a moral judgment on us for being participants in it. Indeed, uh, when we began the effort for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, we talked about the importance of separating the war from the warrior. But uh, <clears throat> cognitively, people could not differentiate between the actual Vietnam War and the participants in it. So we were uh, many times vilified and spat upon, and people would flip us the bird in, in airports. And it was a, kind of a difficult time to be in the service, but for me, it was uh, 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 19 months of active duty. I was very lucky, actually, to become seriously wounded uh, during my time in Vietnam, which gave me a completely free education. So I merely selected the most expensive school that I could get into, which was uh, American University in Washington, D.C., got a, a master's degree uh, in psychology. During the time that I was studying for ma my master's degree, I slowly but surely became an authority in what is no, now known as post-traumatic stress disorder. I did a, an ad, attitudinal questionnaire survey 
and have published the result, results in Military Medicine, a, a professional journal, testified in front of the U.S. Senate and wrote an article in the Washington Post. And if you do those three things, no matter what you're studying, you're automatically a recognized expert. So I all of a sudden had some credibility uh, intellectually. I became very fascinated with something known as the survivor's conflicts. And you don't have to be in a war, you can be in a car crash, you can be in a bank robbery in which there's a fatality, but survivors many times feel guilty uh, for having survived. Very common phenomena among uh, military veterans, the survivors of events like the Holocaust and World War II. So I had this body of knowledge, and in 1979 went to see a movie with my wife uh, called The Deer Hunter, and uh, the next morning, I announced that I was going to build a national memorial in the center of Washington, D.C., engraved with all the names of the casualties. And I went to my boss at the Department of Labor and told him what I was doing. I was a GS-7, the lowest employee uh, at the Department of Labor at the time, and told him I needed a couple days off. And he said, well, you know, Scruggs, we all need a mental health day from time to time, but why don't you take a week? <laughs> Well, during that week, I became very uh, in interested, flipped back through the old textbooks to a guy named Carl Jung, who was one of the original students of Sigmund Freud, who talked about collective psychological states. And suppose your football team here won the biggest game in, you know, the championship. This would affect the psychological state of everyone here at Berkeley. Uh, Nations have psychological states as well. So I had a theory that I could build this memorial engraved with the names of the casualties that would give the military veterans the recognition denied them and also uh, have an effect on the entire country with respect to healing the wounds, uh, some of the wounds uh, of this war. I enlisted uh, George McGovern, who was a presidential candidate, in case you don't know, who ran on the anti-war platform, who, by the way, lost in 49 out of 50 states uh, when he ran for the presidency. But he, he helped, and Barry Goldwater helped, who was a big hawk, hawkish fellow on the Vietnam War. And so we, we got a very wide variety uh, of people involved, including a friend of mine now who lives in Berkeley. His name is Country Joe McDonald, somewhat famous for having sung a song at, at Woodstock. So. I started the effort and uh, announced it at a press conference, and uh, this, this was May of 1979, and, and by July 4th, I got a call from Associated Press. They wanted to know how much money I'd raised, and I said, well, I've, I've actually raised $188.50. So we were not off to a stunning start. I had no idea what I was doing, but we needed a team. You know, we needed accountants, we needed attorneys, we needed experienced lobbyists, so we got this team together. and. Uh, put together a brain trust to make this all happen. We decided that the symbolism of the Lincoln Memorial with the, its u unique legacy, this was the war that saved America as a, as a united country. This was a war that ended s slavery. This was the most divisive experience in American history, the Civil War, yet the most divisive experience uh, for foreign wars was the Vietnam War. And indeed, n not everyone here was alive during the 60s, but uh, those who were will remember college campuses, Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle, tear gas. Uh, I think Berkeley holds the distinction of having had uh, helicopters actually spraying tear gas on the crowds. So uh, this was a very dramatic time in American history. But the, the hope was that I could sort of bring people together through this by using the names. So we got a bill through Congress to put this next to the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, we decided to have a design competition. And we had the largest architectural design competition held in the history of Western civilization. That's an absolute verifiable fact. The winner was a, an undergraduate at the time at Yale University, and her name was Maya Ying Lin, a Chinese American, a uh, very brilliant design. She used the verticality of the other monuments, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, to, uh, to she worked with them and, and using really the, the Asian concepts of yin and yang, came up with a brilliant idea with this horizontal memorial the names on the memorial are not alphabetical, but they're chronological. 
So they're really like pages in a book, and the beginning and the end of the war meet in the center of the memorial. It's a very simple memorial, and uh, uh, it became very controversial. People said black's the color of shame, all the other monuments are white, and this was on 60 Minutes, and the Wall Street Journal had editorials. So we had to find a compromise. We were uh, outgunned uh, politically. The compromise was to add a statue. The memorial was actually dedicated in 1982, three years after we introduced the legislation. So we introduced the bill, had the world's largest competition, and raised all of the money, which was $8.4 million, mostly from $20 contributions from small people to build the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It became uh, very well known, very well recognized. Immediately, people began leaving things there, and uh, there are now, there have now been 120,000 items left at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, more than twice the number of of, than there are of names on the memorial, which is uh, a little over 58,000. People feel compelled to leave things there. It's been studied by sociologists and psychiatrists and so forth. There's no precedent for it, but people keep doing it. So what uh, we're doing now is that we're going to build an, an underground uh, educational center across the street from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. This will show some of these great items that have been left there. Uh, it will teach uh, people about more about the casualties of Vietnam. We'll have their photos there, which will change every day. And uh, it will be a very profound uh, and positive educational experience for those who come to visit it one day. Uh, it will teach about the, the experience and the values of, of courage and honor and uh, duty that have uh, motivated our service people since uh, the days of uh, Lexington and Concord in 1775. Now, the other thing, I just returned from Vietnam, uh, and this is a, a lovely country. I, I hope that anyone who has an opportunity to go there as a tourist uh, does, does that. We have a program in Vietnam, which is now nine years old, in which we actually remove uh, unexploded ordnance uh, from that country. We have removed uh, thousands of pieces. We blow them up in place, the small pieces. The other ones, we have people who defuse them. And uh, I've, the Vietnamese, as you may know, have been at war all of the last century. You know, they were conquered by the Japanese. They fought the French. They had their problem with the United States of America. And uh, they have had nothing but war, but they've had now over 30 years of peace. This is a country that is not creating any problems for Asia. Uh, they're not exporting weapons. They're not making nuclear bombs or anything like that. And it's a great pleasure and honor as a veteran to uh, give something back uh, to them. And we've removed a lot of ordinance and people who've been hurt uh, from it. We've set them up in little businesses, uh, we'll buy them some ducks, and they can sell ducks and so forth. And uh, so they earn a living. So that is the end of my tale, and I'm good at, at doing things in exactly 10 minutes. If someone says 10 minutes, uh, I, I, I will do it in 10 minutes, and I've just completed it. Thank you all very much. My final thought to each and every one of you is that if you, if you have some idea, no matter how big or small, uh, even if you don't know exactly what you're doing, uh, once you begin the process, uh, you can be uh, amazed what you can accomplish, whatever your cause is, uh, battered women or, or, or some international cause. Uh, don't be afraid to take the initiative. That's what leadership's all about. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we'll just go down the table in order, which makes the most sense at this point, and I call upon Admiral Robinson, who's hear his reflections on this general theme. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm both awed and honored to be with this extraordinary panel, um, despite the fact that I had no connection to Dartmouth. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I will say, though, that I voted in the one state that was Massachusetts. one Massachusetts, <laughs> so, which is a bit of an introduction. I uh, span the generations, in a sense, uh, having been a protester against the Vietnam War and entering the armed forces in 1971 during the, during the struggle. Uh, entering the armed forces with the 
intention of serving the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who were serving our country in a war that I very much disagreed with, uh, profoundly uh, antagonistic to the war, but not to the warrior. Um, however, I did not serve in Vietnam, and uh, my only period, significant periods of active service are Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, which um, is uh, the Afghan conflict. Today, uh, we're taping on the 3rd of February. I mentioned that date because on the 3rd of February in 1943, just after midnight, a troop ship named the Dorchester with 920 uh, American soldiers and Coast Guard men and Merchant Marine on board was struck with two torpedoes off the coast of Iceland. Uh, that happened to many ships, but this one was sui generis, and I'll try to explain why. But first, let me tell you that have you seen World War II movies with ships struck with torpedoes and the like, and you know the lights flicker for a moment and then they come back on, and uh, that's a, necess a necessity of filming. You can't film in darkness. But it's not true in reality. Uh, immediately after the torpedoes struck, um, the ship began to list severely. All the lights went out. The soldiers needed to find their way on deck uh, and uh, sometimes walking literally on what had been walls before the torpedo struck. There was smoke filling the passageways. And when they got on deck, they found four chaplains who were amongst the oldest people on board, um, having uh, already graduated uh, um, seminaries and several having uh, served congregations for a significant period of time. Those chaplains were Father Washington, were Reverend Pauling, Reverend Fox, and Rabbi Good. Those four chaplains took charge of the chaos aboard uh, that, uh, the deck of that ship and started handing out life jackets uh, until the life jackets were depleted. And then, uh, intuitively and without conversation amongst the four of them, each untied the life jacket that they were wearing and placed their life jacket on the life, on the, uh, onto one of the soldiers that was coming forward seeking that one hope for salvation in this world. Uh, when the, um, the ship sank in less than a half an hour, in 27 minutes, and of the 920 souls that had sailed, uh, 230 were rescued by the Coast Guard escorts and 668 perished. 230 of those individuals testified to the unique gift of that of those two Protestant chaplains, the Catholic chaplain, and the rabbi. And that story in February of 1943 became a powerful part of American mythology. And I don't mean mythology in the sense of inaccuracy, but rather in the sense of the story, that we, the foundational stories we tell about ourselves. It helped America understand itself as a country of at least religious diversity. And that's part of what the World War II experience was writ large, where you had uh, young men, almost entirely men, uh, less than 5% of the American armed forces were made up of women, 4.4%. But young men from Brooklyn and Berkeley and Biloxi and, um, and Butte, Montana, all serving together, not just for a few months, uh, but for years and getting to know each other. And, the war um, mobilized 16.1 million U.S. Um, military members out of a cadre, the male cadre available for draft from the age of 18 to, uh, to 39 was just under 20 million. So 16 million out of 20 million, an entire generation. I mean, of the remaining four million, some were incapable of serving for a variety of reasons. Um, so that in, nearly that entire generation of men, and in those days it was 
in America about men, um, served and became unified and, and had a sense of identity as Americans that hadn't existed before. Part of that was a religious identity that described America in the paradigm of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. Another event that, um, that came out of that war was, of course, uh, the capture of Iwo Jima. Uh, the raising of the flag became iconic. The uh, flag was raised on the 23rd of February. On the 26th of March, when the battle was just concluded, uh, the uh, cemetery on Iwo Jima was dedicated. And a rabbi, Roland Gittleson, uh, preached the following dedicatory address, which was carried across the country in the newspapers of this land at a time when people still read newspapers. Um, and I'm going to quote one paragraph of, of his dedicatory address. We dedicate ourselves first to live together in peace the way they fought and are buried in this war together. Here lie men who loved America because their ancestors generations ago helped in her founding, and other men who loved her with equal passion because they themselves or their own fathers escaped from oppression to her blessed shores. Here lie officers and men, Negroes and whites, rich men and poor, together. Here no man prefers another because of his faith, nor despises him because of his color. Here there are no quotas of how many from each group are admitted or allowed. Among these men, there is no discrimination, no prejudice, no hatred. Theirs is the highest and purest democracy. He goes on to speak um, of, uh, do we, the living, now dedicate ourselves to the rights of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, of white men and Negroes alike, to enjoy the democracy for which all of them here have paid the price. This was a war that redefined the American paradigm. And I can suggest to you but not prove that the civil rights movement of the second half of the 20th century and the uh, availability of higher education uh, through the uh, GI Bill, as it was described by Dr. Wright last night, are all a product of this war. Not so Vietnam. Vietnam was a war that didn't unite in the United States, but rather divided it. And those divisions continue. Uh, I've quoted the uh, two chaplains, or, or actually the stories of several chaplains from World War II. The chaplains of Vietnam serve as a chaplain corps bridge generation to today's chaplain corps that is really bifurcated between those who see a, a United States of multi-religious uh, dimensions uh, and a need to serve people across both denominational and religious lines, and those who see the chaplain corps as a means of bringing their faith uh, often evangelical Christianity, to those who are as yet unsaved and need saving. Now, that's not the approach of uh, the chaplain corps of World War II, nor of the population body politic of this country that came out of it. In World War II, an icon of the war was General Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and eventually President of the United States, who as President said, uh, our government makes no sense unless our government is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. You've got to believe something, but who cares what it is? Today, 40 percent of the chaplains of the United States military believe that their mission is to convince you to support, to believe, to be saved their way. That represents a division within American society um, that the chaplain corps, instead of changing, is in fact mirroring. Uh, and by the way, that 40 percent are those who have agreed to serve within a pluralistic environment. The, uh, there are lots of rabbis, ministers, and priests who, who don't even get that far. Uh, 
to serve within a pluralistic environment. So um, one example of that of the current era is a chaplain now um, removed from the military. I say removed because it was a disciplinary matter. Um, called uh, Lieutenant uh, Gordon Klingenschmidt, who goes around telling people that Christians in the military are not allowed to pray in Jesus' name uh, because he was not allowed to pray at public command settings in Jesus' name. Um, I will tell you that having um, opened the uh, Senate in prayer, the United States Senate in prayer, they give you a set of rules. You can't, I mean, 14% of the senators are Jewish. You're not going to mention Jesus and exclude them when it comes to, and we say together, amen, but not you 14. Um, and so there's a set of rules. Uh, but this uh, Klingenschmidt goes around saying that it is necessary for America to save the chaplain corps. That's a very different America, and, and I put the roots of this in Vietnam. How so? Um, there are two stories of Vietnam. If you to just do a simple Google search, who lost Vietnam? You will find two stories. You will find the story that McNamara eventually came to admit, uh, far too late for the 58,000 mentioned on the wall, that it was never a winnable war, could never have been won, uh, it was the wrong war at the wrong time. There's the, uh, and I suspect that in Berkeley that's a widely held point of view. But there is a solidly held point of view across America that the war was lost not because of the American fighting man, not because uh, it couldn't be won, but because we lost our national and political will. The, there is a, um, an alignment between those who hold that view of Vietnam, many of, you, of whom come uh, having fought in Vietnam or come from uh, segments of the United States that uh, did fight in Vietnam, who believe that we didn't lose but rather the liberal elements of American society lost it for us, who are also those who often support the, uh, the de-evolution of the uh, model of diversity which World War II and its chaplains presented to us. So I don't know if that's 10 minutes, but it's as close as I could get. And uh, thank you, and I look forward to the other comments. Thank you very much. It's uh, appropriate, given the end of the Admiral's remarks with respect to the longer-term effects of the war and the society's response to the war over time to our own day, that our next speaker should be Professor Richard Abrams, who has written on the 1960s and perhaps will help to give, give us a further historic context. Professor Abrams. Thanks, Harry. And thanks for all those comments. I, um, when Harry asked me to participate here about, on, a, on a program of uh, veterans' experience in American society, I said, Harry, I don't know anything about the veterans' experience in American society, but I can talk about the America that the Vietnam veterans returned to. Uh, and that's what I'll, I, I, will, I will attempt to do. And, uh, since I'm not a veteran, I'm probably among very few here who may be, who is not, not a veteran. I don't have any anecdotes. So I'll stick to the history, <laughs> if I may. Now, except for the Civil War, as Admiral Robinson has just said, the Vietnam War was the most devastating calamity in United States history. Uh, the, physical, the physical costs alone, of course, were awful. Uh, as you've heard a few times, more than 55,000 Americans were killed, more than 120,000 suffered injuries requiring hospitalization and rehabilitation. Measured by American casualties in uh, other U.S. wars, it was only the fourth worst war, uh, although it was the nation's longest war, at least until now. 
the Civil War and the two world wars killed more, and they were all shorter wars, but the relatively few American casualties in itself owed in part from one of the most destructive and divisive features of the war, namely the reliance on airborne weapons, including B-52 bombers flying from Guam thousands of miles away and dropping bombs from nearly seven miles up. So there could be no expectation of confining the devastation to military targets. And unlike in World War II, when Americans were far less divided over the justification of U.S. military action, television and massive news coverage on the ground in Vietnam and Cambodia brought it all into Americans' living rooms in graphic color. The disregard for horrendous so-called collateral damage seemed epitomized in the spraying of many thousands of acres with sometimes deadly chemical defoliants such as Agent Orange in order to expose targets in the jungle areas. Now, such policies brought to mind the deathless comment by one U.S. officer following the destruction of the South Vietnam village of Bien Tri. It sometimes, he said, it sometimes becomes necessary to destroy a city in order to save it. Well, the tactics kept U.S. casualties relatively low while maximizing casualties on the ground, inevitably including hundreds of thousands of civilians. Now, this is to highlight the outstanding cost of the war for Americans, the conspicuous callous brutality with which the United States came to wage, wage the war confounded the humanitarian ideals for which American democracy was supposed to stand. It would sharply divide intellectuals and political leaders. Some chose to stick with their commitment to use American power to resist totalitarianism worldwide. Others could not face responsibility for the inhumane devastation. And so George Kennan at one point testified in the Senate, and I'm quoting him, any rooting out of the Viet Cong could be achieved, if at all, only at the cost of a degree of damage to civilian life and civilian suffering generally for which I should not like to see this country responsible." End quote. As our government pursued the war with exactly the consequences Kennan feared, Norman Podhoretz, a fervent support, supporter of the war and later a bitter critic of anti-war liberals, he himself felt compelled to write, and I'm quoting him, as one who has never believed that anything good would ever come from an unambiguous American defeat, I now find myself unhappily moving to the side of those who would prefer just such an American defeat rather than a so-called Vietnamization of the war, which calls for the indefinite and unlimited bombardment by American pilots in American planes in that already devastated region." End quote. After reviewing dozens of researchers' accounts of the war, the veteran journalist Neil Sheehan would write in 1973, and I'm quoting him, if you credit as factual only a fraction of the information assembled here about what happened in Vietnam, and if you apply the laws of war to American conduct there, then the leaders of the United States for the past six years at least, including President Nixon, may well be guilty of war crimes." End quote. Well, the wanton massacre of the defenseless men, women, and children at My Lai would become a blazing symbol for the opponents of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. When President Nixon named Lieutenant William Kelly, the only man prosecuted for the crime, as a war hero, he called him a war hero, it highlighted the gaping division within American society that in large measure was precipitated by the war. Now, such a contrast in moral outlook, which was already growing before U.S. involvement in Vietnam, would leave a lasting, festering scar on the country to which Vietnam veterans returned. And all of this took place, you understand, in the context of dramatic domestic changes that already compromised the integrity of established authority in both the public and private arenas and would burden the returning troops. During the third quarter of the 20th century, the country witnessed truly revolutionary changes in a number of major social and economic 
areas. The business system, for example, into which most veterans sought entry either as wage earners, managers, or entrepreneurs, <coughs> was in the process of a dramatic transformation comparable to that of the second industrial revolution of the late 19th century. Conglomerates and multinationals overwhelmed the single industry corporation, just as in the late 19th century, the large-scale multi-division public corporation overwhelmed the small single proprietary business firm. Now, more than that, the financial deals, financial deals came to surpass production of goods and services as the primary business of American business. The contemporary expression, greed is good, maybe 40% hyperbola, was almost certainly a 60% accurate characterization of the new business culture into which American veterans returned. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement highlighted Americans' traditional hypocrisy regarding social equality. Just as the broad challenges to sexual conventions and the feminist challenge to ascribe gender rules mocked authoritative wisdom about propriety and decorum. At the same time, the emerging consumer protection, uh, uh, protection movement revealed epidemic dishonesty in advertising, packaging, lending, and sales. At the same time, the insurgent environmental movement brought to light the poisonous pollution of air, soil, and water by powerful business interests that were heedless of the injuries that they were inflicting on fellow human beings. Now, that such things had been permitted to happen eroded confidence in the authority of government, business, and, and tradition, at least for educated Americans who were actively concerned about those issues. On the obverse side, it was not possible to overlook the rising anger among traditionalists throughout the country that was directed at the federal government over judicial decisions that mandated school busing that appeared to be too soft on crime and criminals, that challenged local cus customs of piety by banning officially sanctioned prayer in public schools, and that added costs to doing business by requiring record keeping to avoid or defend against suits over racial, gender, and disability discrimination. There was, in other words, a grassroots rebellion rising from the main, main streets and the Elm streets of the country against the so-called elite that many Americans, probably most of them, held responsible for the erosion of a traditionalist social order in which they had felt comfortable. Now, all of this reached a crash point by 1973 when OPEC's oil embargo led to soaring gasoline shortages and prices, and most important, calling attention to the decline of American hegemonic power internationally. Long lines of irate American drivers waiting at gas stations to fill their tanks before supplies ran out signified graphically the end of affluence and the return to an economy of scarcity. That decline had already been marked by the devaluation of the dollar two years earlier, followed by uneven and mostly sluggish growth for the rest of the 1970s and, indeed, for the rest of the century and beyond. For the final 30 years of the 20th century, American economic growth, which had, been un which had underwritten the unparalleled pa post-war affluence of the previous 30 years, slowed to a crawl. When the mostly male veterans returned home and entered the job market, they faced unprecedented competitive competition, both from fellow Americans and from abroad. First of all, it was in the 70s that the bulk of the baby boomers came onto the job market. <clears throat> but not only did the job market become crowded with the flood of the usual competitors, by then, women and minorities have been added to the masses of those seeking employment in fields traditionally reserved for white males. At the same time, American producers, especially in manufacturing, faced vigorous competition from the newly revived and, and develop, developing manufacturing sectors of Western Europe and Japan. So is it any wonder that much of American society turned sour? This is the environment into which the veterans returned. And as the society turned sour, so did American politics. The rise and the fall of Richard Nixon 
sing signal the ascendancy of a politics of trickery and demagogy that would become embellished and magnified by later administrations. Repeated and deliberate abuse, deliberate abuse of facts and outright dishonesty by political leaders and even business executives became a common strategy. Noting the success of the strategy, one conservative political commentator gleefully labeled it, and I quote him, the power of the outrageous. The power of the outrageous. We're still living with that legacy and with the apt motto of the 1970s, looking out for number one. Vietnam veterans were the last of the citizen soldiers, conscripted by their country to put their lives on the line <coughs> in times of need, a need defined by political leaders. There were no victory parades for them when they returned home because there was no victory. Small-minded enthusiasts among some anti-war militants vilified them, confusing their duty-bound service with the misbegotten politics that directed them. As President Wright noted yesterday in his wonderful talk, that confusion underlay the failure of the anti-war movement to link up with the mostly blue-collar draftees who suffered the consequences of their forced service in a misbegotten war. <clears throat> Thereafter, in a sharp break from American history and tradition, the country would depend on those who chose to offer their service. We should be grateful to them for their choice. We should also be a bit wary. The fathers, so-called fathers of our country, long ago cautioned against the establishment of a large professional military. And so I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, reflect on this uh, very interesting recapitulation of our history since the Vietnam War and some of the things that have um, that relate to the topics that President Wright opened yesterday with his interesting talk. Also have to reflect on the gains of the civil rights movement, the achievements of affirmative action, the flourishing of the American research university during this period, the enormous expansion of access to our colleges and universities, and one has to ask whether the experience of the Vietnam War and the disillusionment with some of the country's failures might not have had positive results as well, but I'll leave that to other speakers. Um, our next, um, I do some work myself on Japanese law and society, and I've always found, from, since I was first introduced to his work by a great Japanese scholar whom I had the privilege of collaborating with, that the work of T.J. Pempel is some of the most important that has been done on uh, politics, society, and public policy and administration in Japan. And uh, Professor Pempel's interests have broadened, and he works today on two topics that certainly are directly relevant to many of the remarks that have been made or will relate to President Wright's address. On two of his fields in, of interest today are U.S. foreign policy and Asian, Asian realism. Uh, sorry, Asian, Asian realism, excuse me. Um, topics that also relate very directly, I think, to the Vietnam experience. Uh, Professor Pempel, as I said, is also a veteran of that period, and I've asked him, I, when I called him, uh, I asked him whether he as a former captain in the Marine Corps would be willing to do this. He said, no, he was very sorry, very interested in the forum, but um, he was too young to be a captain when he served in Vietnam, and that he served on the ground. And so I welcome Professor Pempel and would like to hear, as I told him then, and as I believe now, hear what must be his very interesting reflections on his experience and on these topics from an academic standpoint. Thank you very much. And again, it's my pleasure to be with such a distinguished group. Uh, my comments really are going to be much more from the ground up, uh, at the risk of being uh, unduly biographical or autobiographical. But uh, like President Wright, I joined the Marine Corps at the age of 17. I left. Um, uh, I graduated from high school, and the day after my graduation, I was on a train heading to Paris Island uh, with my mother crying at the train station, wondering what in God's name she had signed uh, permission for me to do. The, uh, the comment that uh, uh, Harry Schreiber made uh, is interesting in the, in the sense that I, when I was in boot camp, at one point, six or seven weeks into, um, 
into my time in Paris Island, the drill instructor called me up with uh, what I will clean up slightly, uh, remarks that said, uh, Private Pampel, get your butt up here. The Marine Corps hates you. And I said, sir? He said, they are going to make you an officer. And I said, sir? He said, they want to send you to uh, officer's training school. You have screwed up so badly as a private, they're going to make you a lieutenant. <laughs> and I said, thank you, sir. And he said, you won't. Uh, and about a half hour later, he called me back and he said, Pempel, how in the hell old are you? I said, 17, sir. He said, the Marine Corps needs officers, but they don't need them that badly. Uh, you got to be 18 to be an officer. So that was the end of my aspirations to, uh, to higher living. Uh, I left in 1964 after four years as a corporal, uh, one rank higher than President Wright, but uh, he's since come to surpass my experiences. My experience, in some respects, resonates with um, what Admiral Robinson commented on about the World War II generation. In many respects, when I went into the Marine Corps, I was very much a product of that World War II generation. I was patriotic, uh, but I was also extremely naive in my patriotism. I was certainly uh, very inexperienced with my own interactions with uh, the rest of the world, and I was quite stunned as we headed south to find that when we hit the first uh, rest stop, lunch stop, south of the Mason-Dixon line, the seven black guys who were in our potential platoon were herded off in one direction for lunch, and the remaining 40-some-odd of us who were white ate in a different place. And this experience of working in a segregated South and dealing with a segregated military was in many ways a very informative period for me, one that, that I don't think I ever fully experienced uh, or fully understood until uh, being stationed in Memphis uh, and having a good friend from boot camp who was uh, African American. I, I kept uh, bugging him every weekend to go into town and after about the fourth or fifth week when he refused to leave the base, I said, hey man, why don't you want to go catch a movie with me? And he said, because you're going to be sitting downstairs and I'm going to be in the balcony. And I realized that this was still a very bizarrely undemocratic uh, and unintegrated America. In any event, fast forward from this naivete to a comment or two on the war in Vietnam. Uh, I had followed the war with the newspapers. Unlike most of my enlisted colleagues, I was a very or reasonably serious student of political affairs. I listened to the speeches of Jack Kennedy, uh, uh, Robert McNamara, Lyndon Johnson, uh, and was firmly convinced that this was a war that was worth fighting and that deserved to be won by America because it would prevent Vietnam from going communist. We were supporting our allies there. And my initial uh, skepticism about the war came on my trip back from Asia. I was not stationed in Vietnam. I was stationed in Japan. I was on a troop ship that came back in 1964, April of 1964. And I was with a number of guys who had been in Okinawa, Marines who had, in fact, served in Vietnam. And over the course of about 13 days uh, bouncing across the ocean from Yokohama to San Francisco and Treasure Island, I heard stories that really disabused me of my preconceptions about what had gone on in Vietnam. I remember saying to a couple of guys something about nobody in no, none of the American uh, military are involved in combat and being met with wide guffaws from uh, the guys that I was with. And they said, yeah, right, uh, we all volunteer. Uh, a captain comes rushing in or a sergeant comes rushing in and says, there's a plane down, we need 10 volunteers. And a platoon would immediately jump on a helicopter, we'd go in and shoot up the local village and rescue the captain and then bring him back. But the most telling experience I had was talking to a guy who'd been a tail gunner on a uh, Marine Corps helicopter. And he was telling me that his job was to ferry in the Arvin, the South Vietnamese military, to combat operations. The Americans were not then 
completely engaged in combat. And he said the Arvin tro troops were under orders to face away from the helicopter. And his job as the tail gunner was to shoot any South Vietnamese military person who turned around. And I said, I don't understand that at all. He said, we'd had too many experiences where we flew in the South Vietnamese troops. They were draftees. They didn't want any part of this war. And what would happen would be, as the chopper would pull away, four or five guys would turn around with hand grenades, throw them into the chopper, and blow it up. And I thought, this is not the best military alliance that has been forged in the history of American politics. Uh, my skepticism about the war, though, was uh, was something that I was not prepared to act on. Uh, right after I got out of the military, like many other veterans, I began my, uh, or decided to finish my undergraduate work. I'd done some coursework while I was in the Marines. Uh, I went to Columbia University. There were many other veterans there. We tended to have a very close bonding by virtue of our difference from the other uh, civilian students and our experiences in the military, despite whatever branch we'd been in, usually put us uh, much closer in proximity. Uh, but my two roommates, who had never had any military experience, informed me that they were going down to a demonstration against the war in 1965 in Washington, D.C. And I had been a student of uh, the House on American Activities Committee when I was in grammar school. I knew the dangers that could await anyone who stood up to his or her government and uh, was firmly convinced that I certainly didn't want to enter into a protest, but I was so opposed to the war and so taken by the experiences and the stories of the people who had served there that I decided I would have to bite the bullet and go down. 1965, the demonstration in Washington, if memory serves me right, probably had more FBI agents taking our photographs than we had demonstrators protesting the war. And I realized then and there that if um, Eugene McCarthy came back in whatever incarnation my career was over, I would never get a job Joseph. in the U.S. Joe, Joe McCarthy, sorry. I work for Eugene McCarthy. <laughs> very interesting sidebar. I, I, I don't, uh, 10 minutes, I won't take you to uh, a very interesting political experience, but uh, a woman who went off to vote for uh, Eugene McCarthy under my auspices thought that it was Joe McCarthy. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and I convinced her that Eugene was as anti-communist as Joe. The uh, fast forward, the, um, as many people have said, the anti-war demonstrators were typically uh, seen as very unpatriotic. They were seen as essentially left-wing draft dodgers out for saving their own skins. And so I was very taken when I heard about a group called Vets for Peace. These were guys who had served in the military and uh, who were anti-war. And their primary purpose in organizing themselves together was to make it clear that people could be opposed to this war and have served uh, successfully in the military, but who were still willing to uh, come out and demonstrate, along with the long-haired hippies and the ladies with funny glasses and uh, all the rest. And so I joined Vets for Peace. And I had a very interesting experience uh, somewhere in early 1967. Uh, a guy came into our meeting and said he wanted to join us, and he had been in Vietnam. This was a guy named Jan Barry Crum. Jan was the first anti-war Vietnam vet whom we had met. He'd spent two years in West Point, left West Point, uh, been pulled into the infantry, and had served 13 months, as I recall, in the military. And he said that he wanted to go to the next big demonstration, and between Jan and myself, we rounded up a total of six anti-war Vietnam vets. Uh, three of them, as I recall, were people that I knew from Colombia. And for the first time, Vietnam veterans uh, joined a demonstration, six guys marching just behind Martin Luther King and Benjamin Spock and others in a demonstration in April 15, 1967, that marched from the UN to, I mean, marched from Central Park to the UN. This was the beginning of Vietnam veterans actively opposing the war in which many of them had taken part. Uh, they had very different stories. Most of them had stories that paralleled those uh, that I had talked about with the guys on the ship that I had come back with. Uh, many of them had experienced uh, incidents of fragging of officers uh, or had, in one way or another, 
come to conclude that this was a war that was essentially unwinnable and, from their standpoint, immoral. And uh, what was intriguing was, to me, was the fact that although they still came in for a great deal of the criticism from the pro-war or anti-anti-war demonstrators, for the most part, many of these guys could bond with others who had served in Vietnam. The common military experience transcended the ideological differences. And many of these guys were quite effective in communicating with other conservative ex-military guys about the war and either neutering or transforming their initial opposition to the demonstrations. This, it seems to me, laid the groundwork for what Jan Scruggs talked about, namely the growing activism on the part of many Vietnam vets in terms not only of opposition to the war, but also of attempting to increase and improve the benefits that were provided to the military uh, that had not been given adequate attention by the political machine that had sent them to Vietnam and that in many cases was responsible for them coming back uh, with damage of one sort or another. The last point that I guess I would want to make in this regard, though, is that in some respects I want to identify with Admiral Robinson's comments about the ways in which the Vietnam War and the experiences of both the veterans and the society at large really made uh, the Vietnam War a, an incident that created a fissure within the United States that in many ways has yet to be healed. Uh, the people who lined up on one side or the other of that war have, in many respects, never crossed the boundaries to the other side. Uh, they have become very secure in their own interpretations of the war, whether for it or against it, uh, and they typically find themselves aligned with others of a similar cultural or ideological bent. And it's given rise, I think, to the blue state, red state dichotomy that uh, really prevailed in American politics, in some respects starting with Richard Nixon, but going all the way through the 1980s and into the 1990s. The uh, Vietnam vets uh, continue, to, continue to be quite active in trying to provide benefits for their fellow uh, military personnel. And they've also reached out, it seems to me, to the veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. But I do think the difference is there between the essentially civilian soldiers who served during Vietnam, most of whom ended after two years, three years, and went back to a civilian life, versus those for whom the military has become a much longer career, and who, for better or worse, remain in many ways far more fundamentally isolated from the broader society and who, uh, in effect, allow this bifurcation to continue. So let me stop on that note, Harry. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, before we open the panel, I want to, to open discussion, I want to ask President Wright if he would just comment at the outset and we'll go on from there. I found uh, these uh, uh, comments, these introductory comments, uh, very, very uh, uh, helpful and provocative, and, and I think the individual experiences uh, underline uh, the complexity of some of these issues. And, and, and my, as, as I said, my focus yesterday was on the veterans of the war uh, rather than uh, of the war itself, but uh, it, it's, ob it, it's obvious, uh, uh, obviously still, uh, all these years later, impossible to separate uh, the one for the other. I think that the Vietnam War was so sharply uh, divisive. Uh, I think that we have managed to accommodate uh, those divisions. I think that our society as a whole has uh, uh, managed to try to, to again reach out to the Vietnam veterans and has done that pretty well. Uh, I'm, I think that the scars remain, they're gonna remain uh, for some time. But, but rather than my sort of repeat that again or try to summarize this, I would prefer to hear from some of my colleagues on the panel area. Well, maybe thank we'll you, Jim. Later. Um, one of, as a, 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 taking the chairman's prerogative or the moderator's prerogative, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is the impact on constitutional ideas and constitutional experience and legal experience during the war. There are so many challenges to individual rights and to challenges to, against the government. And among other experts, we have Professor Gordon Silverstein. So 
or respond to his? Well, I'll, I'll okay. try to make uh, just a couple of points. Uh, first off, I think, you know, the, the, the anecdotal, it, it does become interesting. I, I'm, I'm the in-between uh, generation. I'm, I'm too young to have served in Vietnam, uh, but too old to have served uh, in Iraq. Uh, I was, you know, a child of the protest years uh, and <clears throat> very much a part of that. My brother missed the draft by one year. He's three years older than I am, so I, I was within four years of the draft in Vietnam. Um, so, so that, I think, uh, is a different perspective. And, and, and I, I do want to go back, I'll, I want to go to the legal issue in a second, but the idea that, that we, we, we really lack uh, a communal experience any longer. Uh, public schools are, are no longer cutting across uh, the demographics of the society. Military service, which was the great equalizer and the great, you know, the, the great Hollywood movie is where you had one of everything getting together and talking to each other, and, and, and there was a good deal of truth to it. It wasn't quite as idealistic as, as Frank Sinatra would have you believe, but, uh, but it was pretty good. Uh, you know, jury duty uh, is about it, and, and anybody with a high school uh, diploma can probably get out of jury duty. Um, you know, go to the airport, and there's 17 different lines bifurcated by uh, income levels and, 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 and talents. And uh, uh, baseball games, you go into your hermetically sealed box, and you never actually interact with anybody else. There's really nothing left, and I think this, this goes to uh, what, what Professor Abrams was talking about as well. I mean, this is a, a part of the profound transformation of that, of that era. Um, on the legal front, it, the Vietnam War was, a, again, a huge break point. Uh, the draft was challenged in the courts. In fact, it was getting extremely close. There were a couple of cases that made it to the uh, uh, appeals court level, challenging the, the constitutionality of the draft in that war because it was an undeclared war and because it lacked a number of the other legal conditions. Uh, but the draft ended shortly before those cases were quite ripe for the Supreme Court, uh, so they didn't quite get there. Um, the protests against the war, uh, however, did get to the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, this famous case of Tinker versus Des Moines out of Iowa, these, uh, and I, when I lecture on this, I put the pictures of these kids up, and they're, they're right off of a, of a 1920s, you know, perfect ideal, blonde, blue-eyed, uh, well-scrubbed, uh, neat kids, and, and they, they brought this huge case to the Supreme Court. And it was such a traumatic case that Hugo Black, the greatest defender of free speech America has ever known, uh, turned on free speech. Uh, he couldn't tolerate the, the protest against the war. He was getting on in years, and, and it was something that really broke him from his own uh, commitment to, to free speech. So there were a number of major uh, legal issues, of, and, and really this question about the constitutionality of a war, this was uh, the first actually had a, 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 a legal mandate to be in the war. Uh, the War Powers Resolution was an attempt by Congress to re-legislate this. Uh, so there were, there were tremendous transformations in terms of the, the idea that we would even talk about the legality of a war in the United States and, and challenge the president on these kinds of issues, I think, is, is a big part of, of what came out of this. So maybe I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much, Gordon. The, um, the, uh, impact of World War II on individuals is something that came up in Jim's talk yesterday and I, in Tom Brokaw's follow-up volume to The Greatest Generation there was one passage where a veteran of Vietnam talks about his father's experience in World War II and how his father always looked, at, looked back at it as his great contribution as a citizen and how it shaped his life and he said I came back from Vietnam and I just felt it was for nothing and it was a very sad thing. And I think that, if I may just take a minute, that, that World War II experience, I mean, I, I'm of a generation where my uncles and relatives were, cousins were in that war, and it was just, you know, the happiest day in the world when those boys came home from their various combat areas, and one of them never came back, a cousin. And um, I, it makes me think of my days, again, in New Hampshire during the Vietnam War. Um, I was president of the Civil Liberties Union in New Hampshire, and some of the a lot of our business had to do with conscientious objectors, and they were treated as traitors by their draft boards and often in the courts, and it wasn't just as objectors. And that was very embittering, and I think that the sympathy for them built up, but 
we had a, the, the Tinker case was mentioned, and it was a case of student, high school students with an armband protesting, and the principal wanted to discipline them. And at that very same time, we had a demonstration of students walking out of a high school in New Hampshire, and the principal gave them five minutes to get back in, and then he started issuing sanctions, and so a lot of them went back in, and then more went back in, and finally, um, he said that those who didn't come in, were not, their grades would not be sent to colleges, they wouldn't be allowed to be recommended to colleges, and they would do this to them. So it became a case for the Civil Liberties Union, and we had maybe, I think we had, the number 24 sticks in my mind, this was 40 years ago, and it dwindled down to one. You know, carrying these free speech cases is not an easy thing on families and people. I mean, it's a terrific burden on you, and you can become a pariah in your neighborhood in the middle of a war. And finally it came down to one. And this young lawyer who took the case for us, a wonderful country lawyer, never done anything like this before in his life, uh, he went and interviewed her and he told her, he said, you know, I like you, I mean, I'm from a small New Hampshire town, I know you're gonna live with this thing, you know, people are gonna question you for the rest of your life. And she said, I am not backing down. He said, my husband was a Navy flyer, he gave his life for his country, he was shot down, I'm not gonna let his son suffer this fate at the hands of these people. And the invocation of, of, of of his service immediately collapsed that principal and his councils. I mean, the Board of Education folded immediately. You know, you, invoking war service was still, it's so ironic. Invoking war service was something that could offset this kind of thing. So it is, again, again, complex, very complex. All right, um, other comments and questions? Who would like to begin? There, there's something you just um, raised on the, uh, uh, the protest to, to Vietnam. And, and I was trying to raise the point that while World War II was a unifying force, the Vietnam was a bifurcating and polarizing, radicalizing force for our nation. And I'm wondering what the influence of that was in the run-up to the war in Iraq, specifically the political debate, where it seems to me the um, members of Congress were cowered uh, from taking a strong political stand, uh, that they were uh, afraid of being uh, identified, if not as traitors, but as uh, uh, soft on uh, terrorism and, uh, and the like. They were cowered into it. So it was a overwhelming, you know, we all remember Kerry saying, I was against it before I voted for it, and I was against it later. But, um, that, that kind of uh, political pressure, um, could it have been a result of the um, post-Vietnam radicalization, especially, and I want to put it together with something that uh, was said to my left, the, um, the, the sense uh, that we, um, being of my age, I can forget what I wanted to put it together with. <laughs> so uh, as soon as I said to my left, and I'll come back to it. But, but we lost the, uh, the openness to each other to cross the boundaries into the other perspectives. Well, so I think that crossing no the boundaries became very hard for people when they had been accused of being disloyal and treasonable. And I mean, the, but, you know, but the, the, the escalated so beyond. The so-called red voter, um, ironic, ironic. That, uh, that might be, um, also never crosses the boundary either. Uh, and so um, I lived in, in Louisiana for nine years, outside the gate of Boxdale Air Force Base. And uh, it's amazing how there is so little empathy for the Vietnam protester even today. We've talked about Vietnam, and we have not just Vietnam veterans now, but as has been said, Afghan war, Afghanistan, and Iraqi war veterans. Maybe we can come back to this, but um, perhaps Colonel Chavez would like to speak. He, he has heavy responsibilities in our state government here in California for the interests and welfare of veterans, and I think his outlook on this as minister would be important, and I'd like to call one of the peoples in the active military now to comment on their perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to approach this from uh, two perspectives um, and get a little bit off the Vietnam issue, but I'd indirectly reach it. Um, first of all, when I have the opportunity to go around the state and do a lot of different panels, 
and, uh, and as stated earlier, I was in politics for seven years. One of the um, obvious things when you look at a panel is that it kind of reflects the people that are being affected by, you know, wars and military. And this panel up here is basically consisted of white males. There's two of color and we have one female. In fact, I noticed that the audience actually has four females and four males. So they're, they're actually more diverse than we are. And uh, so not to point a finger at it, but I want to give you a, uh, a little story about a his Hispanic impact that the military has. Uh, my father was 17 of 18 children. Uh, 16 of them were born in Mexico. My father, my grandfather fought with Pancho Villa. My father worked in the fields, and when World War II started, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and fought with the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marine, 2nd Division, and um, was at Tarawa, Tinian, Saipan, and in the latter phases of Okinawa. Uh, he worked in the steel mills at the end of the war, but because of the GI Bill, he was able to go to a community college. The, auto, the space industry kicked off in LA. And so as a little kid, I was brought up outside the US steel mills where the Okies and the wetbacks used to live together and uh, where it was common to have gangs and fights. And we moved from there to a suburb in Torrance at which time I became a, a Cub Scout and played Little League. But because of his experience in serving the country in the GI Bill and his ability to work in the aerospace industry, I was able to stay in one little community and rise up and become president of my class and state champion in sports and a lot of other things. The, and, and go to college. My son, as I mentioned earlier, I was joking around with you, he's, he's a graduate of UPenn Medical School, went to Davis, so my daughter went to Davis. And as I kid around with my son, I said, you're the American dream. You know, uh, your grandfather worked in the fields. I worked my way through college in the fields. And, uh, and now you're, you're out of UPenn. So it doesn't escape me when I'm at Camp Pendleton and I see so many hyphenated Hispanic names currently serving in the Corps, and it doesn't escape me that a very significant number of them are not even American citizens. And it doesn't escape me that just recently um, there was a, um, some people would call him an illegal, who gave his life for our country, whose mother was an illegal, who was living here, who the, uh, she became a citizen because she, otherwise she couldn't even go to the funeral and recognize by our country. So um, there are impacts that the military has on changing our society that we don't even recognize sometimes. I would submit to you if it wasn't for the GI Bill, the military and the veterans, you probably wouldn't have Colonel Rocky Chavez, undersecretary, sitting up here today if it wasn't for that. So I just throw that out there for all the things he, about the military and the war. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, I'll, I just want to touch this, I got to do this because it's on TV and CDVA. The California Department of Veteran Affairs may hit, hit me on this one. When I'm hearing the, I want to talk more about the future. What role should our current veterans play in 2015? We know they had an impact. I gave an example of an impact that might happen after the veterans after World War II with my father. Um, I think that's something that we should really ponder because we know that because of the uh, weapons that are being used in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're having a new impact upon our veterans coming back. And I think that uh, it would be much better to invest in their medical care and their ability to go to college and their ability to be part of the American dream than to put up homes like we have plows to uh, swords of plowshares or Vietnam Village in San Diego, little tent cities for veterans who are suffering. That we as a society should be more preventative and trying to uh, ensure that these returning veterans are healed. 
for whatever reason, they have gone there, and though we may not see the, as I mentioned earlier at lunch, the physical ailment of a missing arm or leg, a lot of them are coming back with uh, other issues. And I, currently, we're working at CDVA with the police force across the state, different police organizations, because some of the incidents where police officers are reacting to a very hostile individual out in town is an individual who's suffering from PTSD and too often is, you know, shot or thrown in jail or incarcerated or impacted by drugs. So I think, you know, we as a, you know, a body like this in UC Berkeley, you actually can make a big impact in communities and collaboratives to uh, help these people so that uh, they will have the American dream. Would you like to come back to that? Like back to the theme of the medical needs and so on, but first let uh, Professor Melissa Murray comment uh, on yours. Uh, many thanks to Rocky for noting that one of these kids is not like the others. Um, I, pre I, am, I know I'm the lone woman here, so I wanted to bring up a different perspective. Um, Rocky noted that his father was a veteran and through his service attended college on the GI Bill, and I think that is the classic narrative around the GI Bill. I was hoping, however, perhaps to complicate it a little bit by not thinking so much as of what the, VI, the GI Bill did for veterans, but what it actually might have meant for non-veterans. And there's a sizable core um, of non-veterans, largely women, who were deeply disadvantaged by the GI Bill and its provisions. Um, you know, one of the the narratives that have sprung up around the GI Bill is that this is a way of honoring veteran service, and I think it certainly is that, but we ought not forget that when the GI Bill was created, it was very much a hedge against financial disaster. Um, when the government was thinking about the GI Bill, and President Roosevelt was very much against it at the beginning, and it was only through the lobbying efforts of the American Legion that it was eventually passed, um, but when it was passed, People had the Great Depression in mind. They were very much concerned about the prospect of financial uncertainty, about the demobilized veterans returning and flooding the labor market to the point where it would be saturated and we would be again propelled into a state of economic turmoil. So the GI Bill was in part a way to defer veterans to lots of different types of employment, um, going to college, starting a business, um, creating new lines of economic progress through construction and home ownership and things of that nature. Um, but in doing so, um, it wasn't uniformly good for everyone. Um, your father's experience is notable, but for many Latino and African American veterans, that was not the experience. Um, the veterans' um, home loan provisions and some of the other entrepreneurial provisions were administered locally, even though they were national programs, and as a result were often administered in very parochial ways, so people of color were often excluded from those. Um, women were often subject to co-signing regulations that required them to have their husbands or their fathers co-sign on loans for them, things that white male veterans did not have to have. And then for the non-veteran women, um, the prospect of veterans applying to college and flooding the colleges, including this one, um, meant that they were displaced at many of these universities unless they attended um, all women's colleges, many of which didn't have graduate programs or other professional training. Um, they would be diverted and would be denied the opportunity to have the same kind of education. So. When we think about World War II, and I agree that it's a stark contrast to the way veterans were treated in the Vietnam era, we ought not be too misty-eyed about it. And there are profound differences and fissures that were created after World War II that survive to this day. And one very prominent feminist historian has noted that the feminist movement might have taken place 10 years earlier, but for the work that the GI Bill did to disrupt the progress of women in the American education system after World War II. Thank you, Melissa. And also, um, we have a, my wife and I have a good friend who's an eminent historian of the Latino experience, and he once told us that the GI Forum, which was founded in, uh, had a, a, a former uh, GIs who were veterans and who in the 1940s formed a, uh, an organization that we probably would call militant today and that had a lot to do with the subsequent MALDEF uh, evolution, uh, uh, developed a clout in local politics in some of the towns of the Southwest and became a force for racial integration and equitability in the school. So again, a complexity. Um, and, and Rocky remembers. I, and so that's another interesting aspect. I mean, people who had a sense of solidarity and of empowerment because they'd been in the military 
than organized. I promise to have a military perspective on this. I'm going to ask uh, Colonel Weaver if he would be willing to speak from the standpoint, you know, of how you see this experience very differently, of course, in your institutional setting as a member of the military and with com recent combat experience. Well, I certainly find the, uh, the contrast between the, the returning Vietnam veterans' experience and that of the Iraq-Afghanistan uh, experience certainly uh, somewhat center in our discussions over the last two days. And I wonder if uh, some of that uh, obviously flows from the fact that uh, many that are in uh, positions of authority and power now are indeed of the Vietnam era and recognize that uh, certainly during the Vietnam era it was probably uh, somewhat less common for the uh, war and the warrior to be separated. Uh, and I think now there seems to be uh, regardless of uh, perspective in terms of support for ongoing conflicts a differentiation now between the war and the warrior in a way that I think gives us an opportunity to um, recognize that service in ways that maybe uh, 20 or 30 years ago we, we might have had a, a challenge doing. I'm, I'm certainly interested in, in, in the panel's perspective on that thought and that notion. Thank you. Yes, Rabbi. Uh, Colonel, one of the distinctions is that the warrior is very different. In Vietnam, the warrior was, the average age of the American fighting in Vietnam was under the age of 20. Uh, you know from, you know, we know from the uh, military today that it's a much older military. Uh, the other, uh, and, and therefore a more um, invested military, that is, the, it was harder to notice the 17-year-old that had gone off to war in Vietnam as missing from society. They had never, they hadn't had a job at the plant, they hadn't had a job in town, they were, they had never been part of the larger society. Uh, it's of note that today, almost 45 percent of the soldier, sailors, airmen and marines, and coast guard men fighting in Iraq and in Afghanistan are either reserve or national guard at any given moment. So these are people that are very much part of the larger body politic. They, are, they tend to be much older than the, uh, than the career military. Um, and uh, the, these are people who are part and parcel of the larger society. They, uh, they have children in, in school and they are missing from the PTA or whatever goes for PTA nowadays. Uh, they don't show up to their uh, son's uh, or daughter's uh, athletic uh, contest, and, and everybody knows that they're, not, that they're not there. So the nature of the warrior as a part of society as opposed to as distinct and separated from society um, is, is different for this war. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to point out that we have five people on this panel who have not been given the opportunity just, to speak, in, just including a carrier pilot and nuclear scientist, so <laughs> there must be more perspectives. I'm, I'm moving on immediately back to the question of PST, which was raised here by the, uh, Colonel Chavez earlier, and I'd like to ask Dr. Ash, Asher to comment. Yes. Um, they say that important events in your life uh, stick with you and you remember who was in the room and where you were at the time. New York Times, 1967, the Peace Corps is no longer a deferment from military service. I had signed up for the Peace Corps. <laughs> <laughs> My entire class of uh, Harvard Medical School graduates was drafted. It was the last year and only year that the entire class was drafted. Subsequently, there were no drafts. Um, I had a problem, which is that I was in a subspecialty which did not count for deferment. They did not recognize infectious disease as a subspecialty, so I had orders for Vietnam. So I said to them, what can I specialize in quickly to figure this out, get deferment? And they said, well, anesthesia, but that still goes to Vietnam. Uh, obstetrics, I said, no, it's not exactly right. Uh, research, I said, what? I said, is research a specialty? They said, you bet, but the problem is you have to go to a research institute in the United States. I said, well, I can deal with that. Thereby hangs the tail. Fast forward, 1991, I was the chair of disease control for the Armed Forces Epidemiologic Board when up jump Gulf War syndrome right in our face. Now, interesting phenomenon of that uh, experience. Um, the clinical presentation of 
It's the so-called Gulf War syndrome had characteristics that are not widely known. It was heavily re represented in the reserves. Number one symptom, which was removed from the symptom list because it was considered not a symptom, was anger. Fascinating. Now, if you put all this together, you came up with an interesting phenomenon, and it occurred at the Presidential Commission on Gulf War Syndrome in San Francisco, where they opened the forum to public testimony, and everyone that spoke was a reservist, and everyone spoke said the problem was when they came back here, they couldn't get any medical care for anything, and they were angry. So no matter what it was, we had a flaw in our system, which was that p these people were not eligible, and that's an interesting problem. They went to war when the health care bill, then in progress, was being considered. They came back and they were dumped with no care. At that point, the rules changed because the Veterans Administration said, we will now declare anything related to people that are unhappy with their service in the Gulf War eligible for care. Now this really did change the rules. That's never happened before. There was no disability determination. There were no rules. Uh, the problem was the Gulf War syndrome got a life of its own. But it did offer people a lot of care that they were not otherwise getting. And it did help socialize PTSD in our society. And I think was, was a great step forward. Now, we at the Armed Forces Epidemiologic Board uh, incurred the wrath of the Department of Defense by our skepticism about the infectious nature or other nature of this syndrome. And the discussion of this at the scientific level went to eclipse for about 15 years. But about three years ago, Congress said, you know, there's a bunch of stuff floating around in, in the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs, uh, sci probably decent science that is not being overseen because there is no group to do that. And they created what's called now the Board of Veterans and Military Health of the Institute of Medicine, of which I'm a member. And we are charged with pulling together all the studies going all the way back to Ranch Hand and Agent Orange and absolutely everything to look at, at some of this. Now, the good news is we have the current situation on our agenda in spades. And just a little uh, uh, prediction here, and, and President Wright mentioned something very interesting. Uh, Every conflict has a signature syndrome or disease. The signature syndrome or disease of this current conflict is traumatic brain injury. And the reason is there are a lot of them, but it is a complicated story because most or all of the people who present to, for care have PTSD. So now you've sort of taken a step backward. Now here's some interesting questions. How do you define a case definition of traumatic brain injury? Is it self-reporting? If you have a hemorrhage on a scan, do you get a purple heart? And if you don't, do you not get a purple heart? How does this work? So rather interestingly, uh, this will be a real challenge, and we're working this, uh, this quite seriously. Now, the thing that came out of the most recent discussion at the Veterans Administration of what needs to be done for the current ve veterans is many, many counselors, and they identified like 5,000 counselors. And at our lunch earlier uh, today, the suggestion was raised by my colleague here that it might be useful to deploy some of that into the places where the veterans are living. So a concept of having resources put into a university, and I will pursue this discussion with our group, rather than at some VA hospital, uh, you know, two hours away. So I think there's, there's hope, and I think uh, things will come together. Uh, but uh, that's my experience. And if you remember the famous line from uh, MASH, where the nurse asked this doctor, Why, how did a reverent uh, guy like you ever end up in the Ar Army Medical Corps? He said, I was drafted. Thank you. On the same question, um, Professor Burton mentioned yesterday that he had actually experienced this in coming back from war as a medic in the Marine Corps, and um, I'd like him to comment further. Thanks, Harry. I remember hearing an account uh, some time ago of an interview that was conducted with the uh, General of the Army, Curtis LeMay, uh, shortly after World War II, and he was being questioned specifically on his decision to order the firebombing of Tokyo, which actually wound up killing more civilians than Hiroshima. 
And they said, well, wasn't that an immoral thing to have done? And the response he's reported to have given was, all war is immoral. You allow questions of morality to get in your way and you can't soldier. Okay. One of the distinctions that's made between the coming home of Vietnam veterans and others is that when we returned, uh, since many had levied uh, heavy charges of moral condemnation against the war itself, they also levied charges of moral condemnation against us for our having served in that war. Okay. One of the things that I, I want to be sure that we focus a little bit on here that hasn't gotten a lot of attention so far is the corrosive effects of war on the human spirit. I had uh, what turned out to be a pretty significant case of PTSD, but it was about 12 years before they came up with a name for it. VA was less than useless when it came to trying to treat me. What eventually resolved my problems with PTSD was the discovery of a meditation practice from the Theravada Buddhist tradition, insight meditation. And um, it was so beneficial to me that I began to teach it as well. And I host a sitting group that actually has a fair number of veterans in it. Um, and there's a great deal of emphasis put now, and there has been in this, in this conversation together, on the differences between the Vietnam vet and the, and the uh, current vets coming back, which is that oh, even though may consider, many may consider some of the military actions in the Middle East to be morally questionable, they uh, do not question the integrity or the character of the people who are serving the country, and that therefore somehow that ought to mean that when the veterans come home, they're not going to suffer internally in the same way that Vietnam vets did. Just based on my own anecdotal evidence, my view is that that's not altogether true. If you, for instance, look at some of the data coming out of places like Fort Carson, Colorado, which uh, has had sent units over that have taken on very heavy casualties, what you find is extraordinarily high rates of homicide, spousal homicide, suicide, domestic violence, okay, stories of, of uh, brutalized wives and terrorized children, okay, single car fatal accidents. Um, the vets that have turned up in my sitting groups, they're saying, well, you know, I really appreciate the gratitude being expressed to us and whatnot, but there is still in all no way to make up for what we endured, and in some cases what we did. And that turns out to, I think, in the current day, probably be about as traumatic as anything that any of us suffered in Vietnam. So now we're talking about, well, are there preventive measures we can take? Are there better ways we can take care of the vets after they come home from this kind of experience? I'm, I still go back to the question, if we're looking seriously at prevention, how about focusing more attention on prevention of the arising of the events that caused them to have to go to war in the first place? And somehow or other, when we have debates about whether or not we ought to fly off and start uh, messing with somebody's business somewhere else in the world, maybe there can be some effort made in the future in the way there has not been in the past to ensure that responsible veterans' voices are part of the debate over whether to go to war or not, rather than just how to clean up the mess after, the, after we get back. Um, and as, as you can hear, um, veterans do not speak with one voice. We go, we go to war with certain views about how things ought to be and our role in the world. We come home with perhaps those same views, but informed by rich experience. So I'm not anticipating that this would universally be you know, people speaking with one voice, but most of the, act, of the military activities that we have found ourselves engaged in in the decade have been planned, have been funded, have been driven by people who have no military experience of their own whatsoever. And it Thank seems you, to me that we need to start involving that voice of experience in these decisions on the front end as well as the back. Thank you very much, Lloyd. I still have a couple of people who haven't had a chance, and one of them is an historian who's looked at these very questions in the course of giving a <coughs> Could course I, I, I wanna... in this area, and I'd like to call on Professor Candida Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on the, the question of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a condition that didn't have a name uh, for most of human history, but nonetheless existed. 
Not having a name didn't mean that it wasn't necessarily unrecognized, that we know very well that at the, during World War II and after World War II that the military actively suppressed evidence about uh, uh, what we now call uh, post-stress traumatic disorder, but, uh, and that indeed uh, prevented a film that John Huston had made uh, set in a hospital uh, where uh, soldiers who were exhibiting psychotic behavior because of their uh, war experiences were being treated. The film was not allowed to be released until 1972, probably around the same time that we were beginning to deal with the realities of these issues in the Vietnam War. And there, this is one of the th one of the um, whether we, you know, however we ta however we evaluate the uh, legitimacy or the necessity of a given uh, conflict, this is necessarily going to be one of the of the after effects of that conflict. Another is an economic dislocation. There is no war that this country has had that has not been followed by a major, a severe economic downturn of varying lengths of duration. The Vietnam War, uh, essentially the economic crisis that the Vietnam War contributed to, which I think as Professor Abrams uh, correctly pointed out, was complicated by the fact of the, the deindustrialization and the re economic restructuring of this country, essentially lasted from 1969 to maybe 1983. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that uh, the soldiers who came back uh, from Vietnam actually had to, I mean, uh, I think they're probably their treatment was being uh, increased, but the, it was in a period in which the government was beginning to contract. And so that the, the question of the needs of society uh, the needs of veterans are also being forced to compete with other needs. It seems to me this is something that uh, is only just beginning to happen now, that uh, the economic meltdown of uh, 2008 is something that's likely to last for a considerable period of time. And we're just beginning to grapple with the facts that the needs of returning veterans from the Afghan and Iraqi wars may be competing with uh, political desires to maintain tax cuts, with uh, competing demands for funding not just higher education, but K through 12 education, funding prisons, uh, that we, uh, we're beginning to face the fact that we can't uh, spend money like we have been. Uh, and this is going to have ultimately some kind of effect on what the returning veteran faces. I, I think the, the idea that a war has economic costs was something that uh, our earlier political leaders were well aware of. And this, I think, was, uh, was also part of the idea of the citizen soldier. Uh, as Professor Wright pointed out yesterday, you, um, you do your duty and then you go back home. And we'll take care of you if you're in dire need. Otherwise, uh, you're, you know, you're the citizen farmer or the mechanic, uh, the citizen mechanic. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this distinction between uh, the Vietnam and the Iraq war, wars that Professor Wright pointed out. And I think, again, in the concept of not relitigating, as our president says, these, uh, the legitimacy of these issues, but to think about some of the distinctions that uh, create a climate in which people, to which people return home to. Uh, the Vietnam War probably never had very, uh, did not appear to have very strong support when it was supported by the public, and the support collapsed probably uh, even before the Tet uh, Offensive, which really then uh, 
or began to collapse before the Tet Offensive, and then, which then led to its rather absolute collapse. And this was, and support was not, uh, this lack of support was actually you know, uh, across the political spectrum, which meant that uh, President Nixon, when he be uh, took office and decided that he had to continue the war as part of his larger strategic vision of what to do with China and the Soviet Union, had to figure out how to maintain some kind of public support for his policies and a policy of active polarization of the public was pursued by the White House and by uh, the people supporting President Nixon. We, I, I think we have to avoid the idea of thinking that there was moral, simply moral revulsion against the war and those who might have been associated with it. It was also a political choice that was made by the leaders of this country at a particular time to uh, lay down the line and say, which side are you on? I think uh, just to conclude, President Bush or his supporters tried to do a similar kind of uh, polarization with the Iraq war, with, with support your troops, really meaning support your president's policies. But that didn't work for a variety of reasons. And so the polarization, which we see around the Vietnam War continues to this day, it doesn't exist. Uh, it never was able to take, but not for lack of trying. Thank you very much, Richard. These are very interesting comments. We have two panelists, both of great learning and experience, who haven't spoken yet. I'd like to ask Todd Laporte, Professor Laporte, if he would comment. This has been a very interesting experience this last uh, afternoon and evening, and uh, as we listen to uh, President Wright's reflections and this today, and I've been sort of taking a different role, uh, and I, I'm found the faculty here. I've had numbers of undergraduates and graduate students uh, over the years, and I've been wondering about our responsibilities as a university and as a faculty as the people who come to sit with us bring the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan with them. Uh, last night, uh, the chancellor noted that we have about 200 uh, veterans enrolled. Uh, and he didn't separate them between undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, one can do that. But I expect we will have very likely many more. Uh, and that over lunch we uh, talk with our, our uniformed uh, colleagues a little bit about their experiences in that regard. And so that my reflections have to do really with what obligations and perhaps opportunities we should think about here uh, in, in our campus in the university system with regard to this. In some ways, uh, we, we've taken a kind of a high altitude view of all this through the course of our in discussion so far. Uh, and so I, I began to think about what differences the so our new veteran returnees will be like, contrasted to some of the, the experiences we've had in the past. Most faculty here will have had very few veterans in their classes uh, until recently. Uh, we just didn't have them. Uh, most of us, uh, most of my colleagues have themselves were not, were not veterans. Uh, and so I, I began to think about the questions we should pose to ourselves with regard to their experiences and what we need to, to, to do to recognize what they bring, uh, both in terms of their, their backgrounds, the questions that they must come with, uh, rather like the Vietnam uh, veterans and, and re represented by a number of you here, uh, one can imagine that we have two kinds of responsibilities, uh, I think, uh, not necessarily curricular, but it's certainly the way we think about our students. Uh, and one of them is to help us understand the meaning of the experiences they're bringing to us in ways that we cannot ourselves comprehend. Uh, the character of the combat situations in uh, fields of battle now are quite different than, than earlier times. Uh, 
And uh, President Wright did a really nice job last time, uh, last yesterday, describing some of those differences. And we've had some of them here to, uh, to uh, uh, this afternoon. I think we should take them really seriously because they represent the sorts of, of uh, sources of questions and sources of wisdom, perhaps, and certainly sources of suffering that our students will bring to the classroom in a way that most of our younger students don't, bring, don't have at all. Uh, so let me say a little bit about what I think are some of the differences from, uh, it is sort of, a, this is quite speculative besides in, some of them will, will be in the, uh, I'm thinking now about university students uh, and graduate students, uh, rather specifically, there's a whole lot of them that won't be classified here. They won't, they won't, be, they won't be with us uh, at all. So there's a, this is a small set, but it's the set that's ours uh, and that I, I think we should take seriously. Uh, one of them is that, that their experience in the military will be longer in duration than their former uh, former veterans. That means that they will have a whole lot more institutional and cultural experiences in some place else besides this country. Uh, they will be split in their uh, in their experience between the warriors and an equal number of contractors who are doing the same thing and getting paid a whole lot more for the exposure to risks, that's got to be important in terms of their understanding of what the experience was like. They will come from a generation uh, who, while they volunteered for military service, many of their cohorts, age cohorts, volunteered to be Silicon Valley wannabes. A completely different world. So you have a, a demographic generation that in some important ways is deeply split in terms of their understanding of what it means to be in that generation. Uh, Rich Abrams classified as the me generation syndrome, which affects this. That's a really interesting dynamic within. So how do, do they and we understand the, the implications of those dynamics that are being brought to us uh, and one can go in a vector in this direction, I think would be very useful for us later on in the university to pay some serious attention to the implications of this with regard to what we, what we do. But there's another more personal, individual set of obligations I think we have as well. Uh, and that is we as faculty will have individuals in our in our seminars and our discussions and in our, our community who will bring with them a level of uh, experience that's really hard to talk about uh, in, as an aftermath of uh, President Wright's conversation. He will, he will, for those of you who were able to listen to him, he has a set of stories or, uh, that are extraordinarily powerful that they aren't his stories. He's reporting them with regard to the stories of the young men and women that he's been able to visit uh, shortly after their return from being wounded in, in battle. Those stories need to be shared with the age peers of that same cohort. They need to know what it was like to be over there. And we don't have ways of telling them. And in a question I put to him, he said something that really struck me. That I had asked, Are, is anybody gathering these stories? And he thought, perhaps so. And I made the comment like I just did. And he said, but they have stories they don't know that they're stories. Well, if you bring conversation or experience into the classroom with people who have stories they don't know their stories, we have a kind of obligation to free them to tell them to us and to share them with their own age, age peers and with us about what it means to go to battle in the contemporary warfare situation. Most of us cannot imagine 
what that's like. Thank you very much, Todd. We have, of course, two military officers at the table here who have this experience now and are in the classroom at our university with students who are, they are themselves are in the military with a kind of experience that Todd's just spoken of. And I'd like to ask Colonel Stone if he'd like to speak. We have only about another eight minutes, so we'll give you as much time as you need and then we'll wind up. Thank you, sir. I'd like to say uh, Colonel Levy and I share a common experience here. We've been given the honor, I, I call my, tell my staff, the sacred trust of training the next generation of officers here uh, at Cal Berkeley to go forth into the military. And one thing we talked about, the differences between World War II, Vietnam, and the present day, one thing I think is a common denominator there is the young people, young men and women now that step up are very similar in the same concepts that uh, they stepped up in World War II and in Vietnam um, to serve their country. Uh, obviously, we don't get involved in the political discussion within the ranks of the military. Uh, we take our lawful orders and go forth and do what our country asks us to do. Um, and we hopefully train them to understand what is the, the, the lawful way to fight those wars. Uh, we talked about some of the atrocities that have occurred in our past wars, and we try to take that into account to train these young men and women to understand the, the just war concept, the law of armed conflict, the law of war, and take that into account and be able to think for themselves and understand what they should be doing and not doing when it comes to combat situations. Um, we do hope is when they get done with that duty and come back, as many people have brought up in the course of this panel today, um, that our country does provide them the services and the aid and the support they need, whether it's for mental health or physical or just educational support as the California Department of Veteran Affairs does um, to support our, our young men and women when they come back. So I think we'd all agree that uh, that common denominator across, you know, even the last centuries of our country is that there have always been young men, young men and women that are willing to step up and support their country when that time calls. And I think it's our obligation to then provide the support they need uh, when that time is over and they do return. And just to echo, we, to that. We, were, we were mentioning about, uh, you know, some of the, the, uh, the things that our veterans are looking for today, and certainly my discussions with our young people, um, and we were talking about this at lunch uh, with the undersecretary here, uh, echo some of his thoughts, that a lot of our veterans are looking for, you know, streamlining access, streamlined access to education, job opportunity, and certainly medical treatment for any issues that they had. I think from a, a what, do, what do you expect to see with these uh, veterans as they return. Uh, my experience over the last 20 years uh, reflects particularly of today's veteran that they're, they're exceptionally highly educated. Our non-commissioned officer force is probably more educated than it ever has been in our history. Uh, with the educational uh, uh, active duty opportunities uh, for them to enhance their educational background. So frequently they'll arrive on campus with a, a number of credits already in, under their belts. They're married, they have families, uh, they're intensely devoted to their families. Uh, they're very technically sophisticated. Uh, the battlefield uh, dynamics that they find themselves, uh, particularly our infantrymen and, and, and other supporting branches, uh, exposes them not just to rifles but to enhanced equipment that allows them to uh, uh, deliver precision fire in ways that we've, we've never seen in history before. Uh, their ability to understand the informational dynamics in, in the field uh, is at a level that I think really boggles my mind as I see them uh, able to uh, um, find the salient points of information in very complex situations in a, in a situation where the senior individual on the ground might be a sergeant. Uh, the notion of the strategic corporal uh, as the Marine Corps uh, commandant said a few years ago, the three block war where on one corner you're handing out uh, MREs and you're doing a humanitarian mission while two blocks over you're conducting combat operations. The, uh, the dynamics of our soldiers today to differentiate those situations and the, the dynamics that we ask them uh, to negotiate their decisions, I think are as complex as they ever have been. The levels of responsibility as, as we have uh, placed fewer and fewer soldiers to uh, guard against uh, the challenges on larger areas creates tremendous responsibility at the private and the sergeant level. So your veterans now arrive with with uh, levels of responsibility, I think, that our civilian counterparts uh, look to and see tremendously talented young leaders at a very young age and tremendous maturity. Um, and they bring an uh, enhanced level of cultural understanding, uh, language ability, 
um, that we've never seen before as well uh, back into the classrooms that uh, I think uh, will capitalize on, on the educational environment, not only for them, but for those around them. So uh, I think to, today's returning veteran is something that we should be uh, very excited about as they, they populate our classrooms at this campus and others. Well, thank you very much, Colonel. We're getting near the end of our time, and I think that it's important to we even have a colleague running off to give a class, and I think it's really important to give President Wright a little time here at the end to reflect on this as we've tried to reflect on what you had to say yesterday. Thank you, Harry. It, it's, it's been a, a, a wonderful two hours. In fact, it's hard to believe that we've been here that long because it, it, it's moved along so well and, and so many people have so many uh, terribly important uh, observations and insights into this. One of the things that, that strikes me as we've talked about Vietnam, and it certainly has been woven through many of the comments today, is that uh, the, the feelings and emotions, and I won't say divisions, of Vietnam uh, are still uh, quite powerful. Uh, people here uh, that, that went through that experience, uh, whether uh, serving in the military or not, uh, it's, uh, it's still a very powerful part of their lives, and they still think very much about the divisions of that war and uh, what, it, uh, what it meant. And, and I do think, as we try to understand why it is we're treating veterans uh, differently today, which obviously I'm pleased that we do. I wish we had treated the Vietnam veterans differently as well, but uh, we have less control over that. We can work with what we can do with the veterans today. And I do think that, that everyone, even those who still uh, are, are, are angry and, and uh, disappointed and embarrassed even about Vietnam and, and the, the, some of the reasons why we went into the war and even the way it was engaged are saying we have to we have to try to reconcile with the veterans and I do think that's a powerful factor in the way that people relate to veterans today. I haven't heard very many people uh, say anything about uh, veterans today that's negative and then all the time I've been involved with this over the last nearly five years now I, I can't say it on my uh, campus or other campuses I've ever had anyone criticize me for why are you doing this with veterans. They understand that even though they may uh, still carry hurts from Vietnam, indeed may, may still not even be fans of the military, but they understand that. So I think that that is a, a powerful thing. We've learned something from that. I don't think that we, we talked uh, much today about something that, uh, that I'm increasingly of a view we can't minimize, and that's 9-11, and, and, and the way that that caused many people in this country emotionally uh, to think different about some things, to dif think differently about uh, uh, the United States and perhaps our vulnerability. And when we start thinking about our vulnerability, we think more of the military and what they can do to, to uh, protect us. Uh, 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 and, and I think 9-11 just was a powerful, powerful part of our lives. And, and I do think that there is a deference uh, to the military today, which, which is, is uh, very important. Uh, and uh, I, I join in that deference to, to the military, even though I, I acknowledge a little bit of nervousness about that, because I'm not sure that if you look at the principles of our society, that, that uh, we have to remember the civilians who make uh, the major calls. And I have been concerned in recent years, in some cases, uh, where military officers have have sort of publicly challenged uh, uh, civilian leadership. Uh, and uh, even when I've agreed with their challenges, I have to admit to some real unease about this. It's not the way that, that our, our system is, is supposed to work. And, and I worry as well about an abstraction almost of the military. As we're talking about the, uh, uh, the young men and women who are serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, as fewer and fewer of them are from the neighborhood or the the boy next door, uh, we do abstract them a bit. And it's easier, uh, perhaps, to romanticize or to think well about things that are abstracted. But uh, I've had the, the wonderful and times emotionally difficult experience of moving from abstraction to having uh, these uh, servicemen and women be very real people with very real stories uh, to tell. And, and, and there is a bit of a distancing. And, and I'm not sure that, that, that I, I share a view that it's, it's a uh, mercenary force, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that restoring the draft uh, would uh, would deal with this. In fact, I'm quite sure it wouldn't. We don't need a military today of the size that a representative, uh, that, 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 that a truly representative draft would provide. We'd still end up with just a small fraction 
of the uh, draft eligible young men and young women being drafted and uh, there would be all sorts of deferments or, and, and other things that would come into play, I suspect, and I'm just not sure that I would uh, uh, be, be comfortable with some of the options and the way that that would play out. But I, I do worry about whether or not enough people truly understand who these uh, remarkable young men and women are because they, uh, we, we do abstract them. We, we look at a little bit on television, we, we salute them, and uh, then we move on with our daily lives without being affected one darn bit about what's happening there. We're not paying, most of us are not paying for these wars, either in terms of finances or our sons and daughters. Uh, we're not paying in any way for it. 